the age of trench warfare. Twenty million men fought in a labyrinth of trenches and underground tunnels, enough to circle the globe. Many soldiers never left the battlefields, their bodies and weapons swallowed by the earth. Now, a team of historians and archaeologists have come to excavate the frontline trenches. This muddy ground contains clues to a mystery. How did these trenches make World War I so hard to win? This is a, a British Leonfield rifle. This is a, a standard British Bulldog Spade. The evolution of trench warfare is an evolution of technology. For the next 10 days, the team will reveal the hidden traces of the trenches and the men who fought, lived, and died in them. Inside the city of Ypres lie Belgium's famous Flanders fields. This tranquil farmland was once one of the bloodiest battlefields of World War I. Some of the war's first trenches were dug here, creating a new kind of warfare. This land became the crucible of the war, where men died for advances measured in yards, not miles. Today, long stretches of trenches still lie here, hidden beneath the ground. But now, the town of Ypres is mounting a new kind of invasion. Urban sprawl is threatening to pave over these historic battlefields. The last reminders of the agony of this war will soon be lost forever. So, to save the past, a team of archaeologists has come to dig up the trenches before they disappear for good. Among them, the Flemish Heritage Institute's lead archaeologist, Mark de Vilde. It must be possible to protect some of these sites because they are very well preserved, they're very valuable. This real evidence of inhumanity, if you like, this, this war that took place 90 years ago. No one is sure how much they'll find or whether 90 years of mud and erosion has destroyed whatever might remain of the war. The team has allotted themselves just 10 days to dig before the Belgian winter sets in, but no one is sure if they are digging in the right spot. Hoping their research will pay off, they begin excavating where they think the German front line should be. Okay, just walking up to no man's land. Uh -huh. To interpret the finds, the team will need the help of world-class experts, like military historian Peter Barton. Yeah. The lines are going to cross this field right here. An authority on virtually every aspect of underground combat. High ground, yes. On the slightly high ground, and all the British lines are down in the hollow. Uh, I've never experienced an archaeological dig like this before, where you're opening up at the same time uh, the German front line and the British front line, with the team working on both digs at the same time. First, a shallow strip is dug, 50 meters long. What we're doing just here is taking the topsoil off and revealing the subsoil. And here, the metal detectorists are moving in to try to find the, any ferrous deposits. These could be barbed wire pickets, they could be bullets, they could be shells, unexploded shells. We believe that this section here is the trench which was in place from May 1915 until the beginning of the Third Battle of Ypres. Yes. So this was the German front line. Soon, the first relic of the war. Hey, Frankie's holding an 18 pounder shrapnel shell. It's official. It's official. Mm -hmm. yeah. What would have been inside it are many hundreds of these small balls. These little balls are thrown out of the shell into the faces of the oncoming troops. Uh, this was really one of the ultimate 
killers because this thing would make a, an entry wound that big, but because it's made of lead, would spread inside your body and make an exit wound the size of a, a dinner plate. At the onset of the war, the Allies were at the mercy of German artillery. Sandbags and shallow pits provide little protection. Shrapnel rained down from the sky, and the Allies had nowhere to hide. In August 1914, the German army cut a swath through North Belgium en route to France. Their goal was Paris, but they were pushed back by Allied forces. By the end of 1914, the armies faced off along a vast front, with the Allies clinging to the city of Ypres. Because of the, the amount of bloodshed which took place on these fields here, the British also came to believe if, that if Ypres was lost, then the war could very well have been lost as well, and the empire was in huge danger. Just on the outskirts of modern Ypres, the search for the British trench begins. It's dangerous work. There are certain to be live shells. So the team gets a crash course on how to deal with live artillery and deadly gas shells. Also, let me say, blocks of springs that are here, the moment that it ploft, wordt that ongeveer omgezet tot 3,000 keer zoveel lucht. Frankie is putting in a uh, gas flag. So everyone on site knows where, in which direction the wind is blowing. In case we hit a gas shell or something like that, uh, we know what direction we should evacuate. With the topsoil removed, remnants of the war begin to appear. Peter Barton helps identify the artifacts. Frankie's digging away here, and he's pulling up lots and lots of used, fired Mauser rounds, which is a uh, Mauser's the German machine gun bullet. The German army was the first to see the deadly potential of machine guns. They laid waste to Allied soldiers. The twin power of machine gun bullets and shrapnel shells left Allied infantrymen outgunned and desperate for cover. In a letter home, a soldier writes, There's screaming bits of hot metal flying all over, and machine guns going in pandemonium all around. You get down to get cover. You can't get your nails into the ground, and you can't get your head underground. You can't get down because you can't go any further. How the devil do you get out of that unscathed? Sergeant Bill Hay, Royal Scots. Soldiers have nowhere to go but deeper into the ground. The evolution of trench warfare is an evolution of technology. We're seeing trenches in the early stages of the war just being simple scrapes in the ground, not being intended in any way to be permanent. Trenches simply appeared in this landscape because men had to take cover from steel, from bullets and from shrapnel. It's as simple as that. Only four months into the Great War, the British alone have lost 60,000 men. Shallow pits have become death traps. Something has to change, and soon. On the right! Now, the team will find answers. This is the, uh, the first duck ball we've uncovered. They're about to find evidence of one of the biggest massings of men in armament the world has ever seen. An historic excavation in Flanders Fields is revealing evidence of what sent soldiers scurrying for cover during World War I. Shrapnel and machine gun fire set into motion the beginning of trench warfare along the Western Front. The trenches were filled in at the end of the war, gladly erased. But now, on day two of the dig, there's no clear sign of any trenches.
where the German trench should be, a patch of discolored earth offers a clue. It may be a filled in trench or shell hole. That's where you're gonna dig in the dark soil. Yeah, all in the dark soil. Some small sections to see how deep it is. Yeah. 100 meters away, the team is still looking for signs of the British front line. The archaeologists have taken the surface off and they cleaned the surface. And what we're finding now, the very first finds, the very first artifacts which appear at this, at this time. What brings to your attention, what really shocks you in some ways, is the fact that as people are going about their business, farming here, walking across, they're walking across live ammunition, they're walking across grenades, they're walking across gas shells. These, this is a, what's known as a Mark 7 infantry bullet. This was the standard bullet that was fired from the Lee Enfield rifle. Uh, this is a, a position from which um, rifle bullets are fired regularly in great mass. And you can imagine that this kind of thing was done at stand two every morning. The soldiers would get up. They would remind the Germans, and the Germans would remind the British and Canadians and other guys that, you know, they were still there. To find the Allied trench, the team digs deeper into the clay. Oh, I must think. Okay. So we come at the round table, Monsieur. Ironically, the first thing revealed by the team's shovels is a shovel. This is a, a standard British bulldog spade. I mean, these are still made today. Uh, British troops in Iraq are probably carrying these right now. And this is uh, perhaps one of the best spades for this action. It's got an open mouth. This was the day-to-day -day piece of kit that would be necessary to dig these trench lines. By late 1914, with thousands of shovels issued to troops, both armies dug in, and the Western Front was born. Both sides simply put down their rifles, picked up their spades, and began entrenching. The spade took the place of the rifle. Put that you didn't need your rifle anymore, you just needed to get cover and entrench, and entrench, and entrench. Those trenches are still here, somewhere. The trick is finding them. As the second day wears on, the team again checks 90-year-old trench maps and aerial photographs, trying to pinpoint where they should dig. Yes, yes. And he, he worked, he was the German officer which uh, worked on some of the trenches. If they're digging in the right spot, they'll find signs of the Allied trenches and across no man's land, the German line. You've got to approach this very optimistically. You don't know what you're going to find, but it nearly always surprises you. Finally, a breakthrough. What we've got here is a huge relief. They find telltale markings of an Allied trench. This is the, uh, the first duck ball we've uncovered. I mean, there were worries earlier that uh, perhaps the whole of the trench and the infrastructure had been removed, but it hasn't. The duck board was designed to keep your feet out of the water. So the duck boards actually held you off the ground and they kept your feet dry absolutely key uh, aspect of uh, First World War. Uh, it's, a, <laughs> it's a great thrill. It seems a bit stupid getting excited over duck boards, but I am. <laughs> this particular duck board gives us a, a, an important piece of information because we can see which way it's oriented. So the man would stand on it like this. And this probably means if this is the front line, then this was the fire bay. In fact, what I'm standing in here, it's hard to believe, but this is, it's not only the front line of this part of the Western Front on Pilkham Ridge, this is the front line of the British Empire. 
The duckboards mean the team has finally identified the Allied front line. The German line should be 100 meters away. Duckboards were invented so the Allies could fight a second enemy, water. The water table controlled all trench depth, wherever you were on the Western Front, but especially in this area where it was so close to the surface. Soldiers dug trenches for safety, but what they find is water. The aquifer lies just four feet below the surface. Worse still, the clay soil traps every drop of rain. Trenches become ditches. In early 1915, heavy rain added to the soldiers' misery. A Canadian soldier describes the frustration of digging on the front line. It was very bad weather while we occupied the trenches. The continuous rain making it very muddy and also doing great damage to the parapets. Each morning we would find part of the trench given way, and during the day the company were kept busy building it up again. Private John F. Mould. German soldiers had less trouble. Their trenches were high and dry. The reason why the, the German trenches are higher is because they chose to put them there at the beginning of the war. They deliberately moved forward onto the high ground or pulled back onto the high ground. They didn't mind going back as long as they were on high ground during the winter. So what we've got here is, is the Germans on a slightly higher contour, a drier contour, and that means they can pump the water out of their trenches and it flows down into the British trenches. Duck boards provide only partial comfort from the wet. Many soldiers who escape German bullets become victims of the great curse of the war, trench foot. Trench foot was something which you got if your feet were constantly in water. Your feet literally started rotting away. You could get gangrene and you'd have to have to amputate. All year. In one case, a single battalion had 400 men struck down with trench foot. In many cases, the only cure was to amputate. Despite the conditions, British orders were to hold the line at any cost. The British were told to stay in the position in which they last came to rest. And commanders in the field would say, but this is a terrible position. We're in a bog here, sir, you know. And they said, no, that is it. You stay where you are, you dig in there. The British do not go back. Britain's refusal to draw back created one of the most exposed positions of the Western Front, the Ypres salient. Here, the Allied line bulged out into enemy territory. From the high ridges around Ypres, Germany fired on Allied soldiers from the front, both sides, and behind. For the Allies, the geography of the salient was a tactical nightmare. This area, the Ypres salient, was the, uh, the cauldron, the crucible, really, of the, uh, the Western Front for the British forces and all the other, what we might call, colonial forces, if you like. Forces from all over the world came and fought in these very trenches which we're excavating here. The team is about to uncover signs of the bizarre world that soldiers would find here. This was their, their home, their life. A world where everything seemed designed to maim or kill. This is First World War, by the way. In the spring of 1915, new fighting men flooded into Belgium's now infamous battlefields. They traveled from the furthest reaches of the Commonwealth, from Australia, New Zealand, India, and Canada. Hundreds of thousands of men had volunteered to live, kill, and die in the trenches of the Western Front. Now, day three of the dig, archaeologists are uncovering signs of the soldiers' strange new home. So we're beginning to see the, 
of the evolution of this trench system. We can see the straight sections, we can see the fire bay here, we can see the traverse back again. So those shapes which we saw on the aerial photographs, we're actually beginning to see them on the ground now. This, it's, it's taking shape into precisely the, uh, uh, the kind of structure which the, the soldiers fought in during the war. The trenches wound continually around sharp corners, and it was absolutely necessary to keep in touch in order to avoid taking the wrong turning. If one stopped for a moment, it was easy to lose sight of the man in front. Thus, we would be pounding along at a killing pace with our heavy equipment swinging and clattering, stumbling and cursing in the darkness as far as our breaths allowed. Private Frederick Elias Nunes. These are the boards which tens of thousands of men from all over the world would have walked on the trenches they would have lived in. This was their, their home, their life. It, they were almost exiled here. They were here for so long. It was an alien world, this. Uh, things were done completely differently. You could forget everything you ever knew in the civilian life. And from that point onwards, once you moved into the trenches, you became the troglodyte soldier. You didn't live in houses. You lived in holes in the ground. You would have the smell of bare earth, the smell of damp earth. You had the smell of decay, the smell of human decay. And that was something which they had to get used to. New arrivals soon found that their first task was not to fight, but to dig, to build the most sophisticated trench system the world had ever seen. This was a military engineer's war. They were responsible for not only designing and building the trench system, but for everything else, the whole of the infrastructure. Whatever you pick up in this trench will have been designed. Nothing at all was random. There was no random evolution in, in trench warfare. As soldiers dug down, muddy walls would cave in and wash out. But the Royal Engineers had a solution, and the team finds evidence of it a meter below the surface. We've got into the fine detail of trench construction here now. These are the A-frames, which both held apart the, the trench sides. You can see these would have extended further up here, holding those um, steel revetments in place, stopping the trench collapse. And on top of the A-frames, your duckboard went to sat on the top of those A-frames there. The water would pass underneath so that any water that came into the trench would sit below the level of the, of the duckboard so it kept your feet dry. Absolutely critical part of trench warfare. This is an indication of how the British and Commonwealth armies tried to bring regularity to what they saw here, to build new technologies, to invent things like the A-frame trench systems. The British and the you know, Commonwealth allies were trying to command that piece of ground. Within just a few months, improvised rifle pits had evolved into a vast underground fortress. Soldiers construct 10,000 miles of trenches. Soon, enough trenches have been dug to circumnavigate the globe. But no trench was ever completely safe. Project leader, Mark de Vilde. It, it uh, seems that there has been an explosion here, and that's why the, the dug boards and so on have disappeared. One hundred meters across no man's land, the team finally finds signs of the German trench. Look at the effort here. Here in the German trench, we can see the German style. They used A-frames the same as we did, but they put planks, heavy planks, longitudinally.
interesting here because we can see the depth. It's what, two and a half, three feet from the ground surface. Much more shallow than the British Trench on the other side of no man's land. So on the surface, they built these massive, very, very imposing breastwork structures to make it the British feel even more looked down upon. So it's a, it's a very important uh, learning process we're going through here. Terrific dig. As the war escalates, engineers try to turn their trenches into impregnable fortresses. To help, they modify a familiar farm tool. In front of these trenches, there would be, at the beginning of the war, very, very simple uh, barbed wire defenses. Some, at the beginning, simply one single strand of wire, and that gave them a terrific feeling of security, a one single strand. Later in the war, you had immensely dense entanglements. They may have come all the way out here to where I'm standing. This is the kind of stuff we're talking about. This is first of all barbed wire. If that's, that's proper barbed wire. It's not agricultural. Barbed wire was just the first line of defense. Behind it lay the fire trench. Further back, support trenches would hold reserve troops during attacks. Perpendicular communication trenches link up the lines, allowing men, messengers, and munitions to travel to and from the front. As trench fortresses developed, neither side could move. This standoff became known as mutual siege. Trying to break through enemy lines became almost suicidal. The team is about to find weapons designed for this strange new stage of the war. This is a sniper's plane. They'll also find the soldiers who died fighting it. In an historic first, archaeologists are excavating two frontline trenches of World War I. One German, one Allied. Day five is the team's halfway point. Well, this is a, a typical survivor of the trench warfare. It's, it's a rifle, it's a British Lee Enfield rifle. This rifle was uh, designed and developed in the early part of the 20th century and was used right the way through the Second World War. It's a mainstay of all Commonwealth and British troops that were engaged here. It's very characteristic. These rifles have a, a snub nose, which is uh, very typical. And we can see that this is, this is where the nozzle would be. This is the position of the business end, if you like. This is where the trigger would be. This is where the bolt was. So this is as the soldier would draw back the bolt in order to load this. So the big question would be, what is this? Now, this is a bit unusual. It's not something that is commonly seen in Lee Enfield rifles, and it's quite possible that this represents the housing for a sniper scope. Even in an underground fortress, no one is safe. It was particularly dangerous for young soldiers or soldiers who just arrived in the line, never been in the line before. And uh, there are many accounts of this where they say, well, where is this war? And they just put their head above the, the parapet. Bang. Pratt was hopeless. His head was shattered. Splatterings of brain lay in the pool under him, but he refused to die. Old Corporal Welch looked after him, held his body in arms as they writhed and fought feebly as he lay. It was over two hours before he died, his voice gurgling and moaning low and dry, a death rattle fit for the most bloodthirsty novelist. British officer John Carrington. When you hear 
the reports that it was all quiet on the Western Front. Quite often, there were these individual tragedies as people went past those frontline positions and were picked off by these fixed rifles. Each month, 30,000 men died along the Western Front without any battles being launched. Military officials accepted this number, calling it natural wastage. For both sides, snipers are a constant threat. The Germans are 120 meters away. For a sniper with a telescopic sight, that's absolutely nothing. 400 meters is nothing. Five, 600 meters, they could drill you through your forehead at 600 meters. These were the, the top marksmen. It only took a single shot to kill. Digging deeper into the history of the war, the team finds one of the tricks of the sniper's trade. This is a sniper's plate. No, it wouldn't normally sit flat on the ground like that. It would be in the, the British breastwork. There's a hole in the middle, and that's where you would have put your rifle through to snipe at any movement in the German lines, just across no man's land there. The peculiar little feature uh, on the top is actually, it's like a window. You closed that when you'd finished firing, otherwise they would be able to see a little light source through it. Uh, we can see, looking at this plate, that it's, uh, oh, it's a good inch thick, solid steel. And that was designed specifically to stop a, um, a, a German bullet, uh, so that the sniper was safe behind there, the British sniper was safe behind his plate. However, um, they did devise other methods to actually pierce those. And this is not with armor piercing bullets, but simply by reversing the bullet in the cartridge so that the point end is into the bullet and the, the, the end which is being fired is the blunt end. It's British, so it's been fired at the German line. These are very, very rare. The reason why they're so rare is because they were made by the soldiers themselves. These were not standard issue. In fact, they may have been against the, the rules of war. Now, this would hit that with such energy that it would possibly not go through it, but what it would do, it would burst a little bit of steel, fragments of steel, off the back of the sniper plate. And that they would spray into the sniper's face. As time passed, they found other ways of dealing with uh, snipers, and this was one of the most popular. It's designed by the Royal Engineers. They actually des designed a, uh, a fake head, which was pretty solid, so that when a, a German sniper's bullet passed through the head, it would drill a tight hole. You then bring the head down and put a periscope through the hole and then take it back up again, exactly the same distance you brought it down, look through the periscope, and that would take your eye line straight to where the enemy sniper had fired from. He would not be sniped back at, he would be trench mortared. You got the trench mortars onto him, or the artillery even, and just plastered that area, and that, that literally uh, sent it to oblivion. As methods of finding and destroying enemy marksmen improved, the number of deaths by sniping fell sharply. first sign of human remains. It'll take some time to excavate this because it's almost done forensically. The finding of human remains on the battlefield now is taken possibly more serious than it ever has been before. The bones are found two meters in front of the British trench. Archaeologist Yannick de Heysa is in charge of disinterring the remains. This is a piece of his leg. This is the pelvis we have. 
probably this is his other leg. We have no sign of skull yet. Um, you can ask the question whether there's going to be a skull. The find triggers a strict protocol, and the first order of business is to determine what killed this man. The prime suspect is shellfire, a leading cause of death during the war. The maiming and the, the agony which some of these men went through, particularly from shell fragments, where they could just be torn in half. Shards of steel from the shell casing, which could quite just take your arm off, take your head off, cut you in half, just take you to pieces. As Yannick cleans away 90 years of mud, a new mystery emerges. So the problem is now whether we're dealing here with one skeleton or with more skeletons. Why would these men be buried just in front of a British trench? The answer will open one of the most horrific chapters in the history of trench warfare. It's day five, and in the hunt for the traces of World War I, archaeologists on the British front line have uncovered human remains. But as team member Yannick de Heysa digs out the skeleton, she makes a remarkable discovery. We cleaned the area a little bit further and we had to change our theory a little bit. Uh, now we don't have one skeleton anymore, but we have not two skeletons, but even three skeletons. The remains are not in a trench, but in front of one. We've also discovered that these skeletons, they're laying in a shell hole. Most bodies are found in, in shell holes, not in trenches, because they've cleared the trenches, because they had to use them. As the trench lines expanded, they had to expand, of course. It was certainly not uncommon to, to be digging away and extending your trenches and run into, similar to what we found here, a shell hole which had been used as a, a mass grave. During battle, it was hard to create cemeteries. The simple act of extending a trench could lead to horrifying discoveries. Under fire, corpses couldn't be properly moved. It was a grisly task. But soldiers dug on, and the dead were entombed in mud once more. Ninety years later, the team must discover the cause of death. What happens is that we call our uh, physical anthropologist. She comes over here. Oh, let's take them out. She looks at the skeleton. Yeah, they are very well preserved, yes, indeed. And that's because of the environment, the soil. She can... Um, Terminate uh, the age of the skeleton. Um, she looks at all his diseases. Um, sometimes she can look at the leg and see whether he's um, a cavalryist or not. Sometimes we have uh, young men about 18 or 20, but I have the impression this man is a bit older. But it's too soon. These remains deserve a proper final burial, but which nation should take them home? Yannick finds a clue. We also found two buttons here. And if you look at the buttons, you can see on the button, it's, it's very difficult to see, but if you, if you clean it up a bit, you can see a burning flame on one of the buttons. And burning flames are typical for French costumes, for French uniforms, so this could tell us something about the nationality of the person um, lying here. So we think it's a, it's a French soldier.
So this guy, this man here, this uh, he has his hand nicely put, his uh, left hand on the pelvis. Which gives me the impression he has been placed here in that position. He did not just fall. The French buttons, the three bodies, the deliberate burial. The evidence suggests a chilling explanation of what happened here. The anthropologists and the um, archaeologists, from the way that these three soldiers are lying, they believe these three men may well be victims of the very first cloud gas attack of the war. In the spring of 1915, French troops held the forward line two miles east of where the archaeologists are now excavating. But on the evening of April 22nd, the lines were about to shift. The gas was released from behind German lines over to our right, about two miles away near Langemark. And what they needed was a northerly wind for that gas, and it took a long time in coming. But they got the north wind on the evening of April the 22nd, 1915, They had tubes going out into no man's land, which uh, when they unscrewed the cap, the gas was re released from those tubes. They released 40,000 cylinders. It came crawling across this field, a sort of a blue-green uh, haze. Heavier than air, chlorine gas sank into the Allied trenches. This area was held at the time by French Algerian troops. They didn't know what it was. Nobody knew what it was. It rolled across these fields and utterly stupefied, terrified, and killed the French Algerian troops. Within minutes, hundreds died. Others fled their posts in terror. A whole section of the Allied line broke and ran. British officers were outraged that colonial troops were retreating. In vain, they ordered the soldiers to return to the line, but slowly realized that they were fighting a horrifying new kind of weapon. You get a strong dose and it gets into your lungs. It destroys the nervous system from the inside. And what you actually do is you drown from within. Your lungs fill with liquid and you literally just simply drown without being underwater. A terrible way to die. Over a four mile front, 168 tons of chlorine gas was released, piercing a massive hole in the Allied line. Wearing primitive masks, the Germans attacked while Canadian troops rushed in to close the gap. 2,000 Canadians died halting the advance, and the front line was pushed back nearly two miles. And this is the precise spot where that German attack was held. From that day, which was in May 1915, until July the 31st, 1917, so over two years, these lines remained fixed. There was not a millimeter of movement. When the battle ended, the bodies of hundreds of French colonial troops were recovered and buried in shell holes close to the new Allied front line. Germany's attempt to gas the enemy and take Ypres had failed. Both sides were again locked in stalemate. But for a few fallen soldiers, this battle wasn't quite over. Now they finally have a chance to go home. The archaeological team feel a sense of obligation for the soldiers they've found. You're not dealing with a skeleton, but you're dealing with a real person. And that makes it 
very worth um, excavating them and getting them out so they can have a proper burial at last. The names of these soldiers are still unknown, but thanks to the work of the archaeologists, they can be turned over to the French army, joining the ranks of the thousands of men who gave their lives in the trenches of Flanders fields. So full honors are given. They're treated with the greatest possible respect from the moment they're found until the moment they're buried. As the bodies are readied for repatriation, the team resumes its work digging deeper into the trenches. Yeah, we've got the German machine gun position marked exactly in the trench where we are here. They'll find signs of desperate new strategies for breaking through the lines. Trench raids were considered ludicrously costly because you always had casualties, you always had death. Each side knew that to win the war, they had to find a way to end the stalemate. The archaeologists will soon find out how both sides tried new, horrific methods to break the enemy. Thank you.